Okay, and where everyone's here and where, where everyone's at, we will show up for exam reviews. You probably need it less than everyone else. Um, did you have any questions over any of the homework or? Uh, not the homework, just the practice exam. Okay. Um, so, and you, you will have uh, the, all the handouts for the exam, and then it's open text as well. But uh, I don't think you need the text. I think you can work everything from the from the handout. So, uh, the first question here is is just on some vector calculus. And so you should be able to, to get the relevant formulas. So this is a vector field that's asking about the divergence and curl of the field. So the divergence from your formula sheet, you know, by inspection, it's in Cartesian coordinates. So you have to make sure that you get the right you know, form of the, you know, you're applying it in the right the coordinate system. But the divergence is just a partial with respect to x of the ax component plus the partial with respect to y of the ay component in Cartesian coordinates. And, and so the result, the divergence gives you a, the divergence of a vector field is actually a scalar field. And you know, that's what the dot product here reminds you of. So the partial derivative of, of the ax part would be 4x and the partial derivative of the ay part with respect to y is just x minus 2y. So this is 5x minus 2y for the divergence. The curl um, let me let me just keep it right there, so I can still see the the vector field. Um, the curl is on your handout. It's, I get it. I, I have it memorized for Cartesian coordinates. Of course, you're not. It's not required, but it's relatively easy to me memorize for Cartesian coordinates because. It goes x, y, z, y, z, x, z, x, y, that's kind of in rotation. So it's x, and then the, the partial with respect to y of the z component, and then uh, minus the partial with respect to z of the y component. Okay, well, there is no z component. And then there's no z variable in either the x or y component. So that is actually going to be zero. And then similarly for the y, it's the partial with respect to z of the x component. But again, there is no z variable anywhere. And then we also have the partial with respect to x of the z component, but there is no z component of the field. So both those terms fall out. And what you're left with is the Z component. So again, it rotates around. It will be the partial with respect to X of the Y component minus the partial with respect to Y of the X component. So that's the only part that remains the partial of the y component with respect to x is just y. And the partial of the um, x component with respect to y is 2y. I do that right, partial of that with respect to x, yeah. So this becomes minus c hat y for the curl. Is that? Any questions about that? So the
the, the rest of them have some relation to electromagnetics. So this next one and uh, you're given a potential field of voltage in cylindrical com components. So, you know, rho phi z could, might be in spherical components um, uh, where it would be r phi, r theta phi. And you should be able to tell you know, from, the, from the variables that are used what coordinate system the thing it, it's, it's being expressed in. So, um, Given the voltage, the electric field is just the negative gradient of the voltage. Now, again, the, the gradient's simple in uh, Cartesian coordinates, but you know, refer to your uh, formula sheet for the other coordinate systems. So the in cylindrical component. Um, cylindrical coordinates, the gradients is, I'm going to plot the minus sign, it's rho, and then it'd be partial V with respect to rho, and then V, partial V with respect to phi, and then Z, partial V with respect to Z. Okay, that's the, oops, I left, there's a one over, one over, row here partial with respect to phi. Okay. Um, our V field is not Z dependent, so that term goes away. So we only have the other two partial V with respect to rho. That's rho to the minus one, so that would be minus so that would get rid of that. We're going to have sine phi over rho squared. Okay. Would be the partial with respect to rho. And then the one over rho partial of v with respect to phi would be one over rho. And then the derivative of sine is cosine. So we'll have minus cosine of phi over rho squared for that one. And so putting the result together, the E field is in the negative of, it would be the negative rho hat sine phi rho squared. The negative of this is going to be plus E cosine phi rho squared. B says how much energy is required to move a unit charge from one point to another along an arc of constant radius and the z equals zero plane. So, yeah. If you sketch the z equals zero plane, it's asking from, here it's giving the coordinates and cylindrical coordinates. So radius of one and angle pi over two, z to the point one angle of zero. So it's asking you to compute how much energy is required to move a charge along that line segment. Now there's an easy way to do this and a hard way. What's 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 the easy way? So the hard way is not too hard, but there's certainly an easy way. Well, look on your formula sheet for uh, force and energy. You get formula that says you get the, the work, it's minus Q times that integral of E dot DL. 
or it's simply Q times the voltage difference between the two points. So, and, and, and our electric fields and electrostatics, our electric field is, is conservative. So that means it doesn't matter what path you take between those two points. The voltage and hence the, the energy only depends on the voltage difference at the, those two points. So that means you know V1 is at one radius of one, but pi over two, sine of pi over two is one. So V1 is, I'll put it here, minus sine pi over two over one. So that's minus one. V2 is at minus sine of zero over one, but that's zero. So V21 is zero minus a negative one or one. And so WE is, and it, it's actually Q times the voltage difference or one Coulomb times one volt. That's actually one joule. So, so it's pretty simple using that approach. It's not too hard using uh, point, point 0.1 to point 0.2 of E dot DL. It's not too hard actually directly evaluating uh, uh, using this expression and actually doing the contour integration. Um, you know, the problem explicitly says along this path, and we'll take that path, but you could actually take any path and get the same result. You could go down the y-axis and out the x-axis, and you'll get exactly the same result. But we'll just, we'll just take the, the path indicated. Well, DL here is actually, we're just uh, changing along the phi angle, so it's actually um, rho d phi. Again, this is, this is on your formula sheet. Look at the differential length formula in cylindrical coordinates. It's got dl is rho hat d rho, but we're going along a contour where rho is constant. It's one plus phi rho d phi, which is this. Okay, that's the only thing that's changing on this contour is the angle plus again z hat dz. Z is not changing. Again, on this particular contour, rho is one. So this reduces to just phi hat d phi. And so in this particular problem, e dot dl, so the, the rho hat phi hat, that dot product is zero. And so you're just left with and cosine d rho squared d phi. But again, on this, on this contour, rho is one. So we get W of E is minus, it's one Coulomb is the charge. And then we're integrating. Now <laughs> at our starting point, we're actually starting at an angle of pi over two and going to zero. Here's point one and here's point two. If we went the other way, we'd get the negative of this result. Okay, so, so we're going from pi over two to zero of cosine of B D phi. It's one over. So it's going to be sine phi pi over two and zero. Sine phi of zero is zero. Sine of pi over two is uh, uh, one, uh, but I've got zero minus one. So that would be minus one times a minus one. I'll write it out. 
minus one coulomb, then I get zero minus one, or again one joule. So even though I, I say in the problem how much energy is required to move a unit charge along an arc of constant radius, I don't say that you have to explicitly evaluate that integral. Okay. As a matter of fact, that would be much happier if you understood that for a conservative field that there's an easier approach. For conservative field, we can de define a corresponding potential and then use the difference in potential to get to get that voltage difference. Okay. So any questions about that? I think that C part here is the same, let me just or similar. Let me scroll up. How much energy is, is required to move a unit charge from a radius of, of infinity? Um, now this is at a, at a height of one in the Z plane, um, but nothing depends on Z actually. So it wouldn't matter if it's at Z equal one or Z equal to zero, but a radius of infinity to one Again, at an angle of zero. So in this in this part, you're asked, you know, you're out here at, a, at infinity, and you're asked how much energy does it take to move along the x-axis from infinity to one. So again, the, the approach there would what's the what's the voltage at infinity? Well, at an angle of zero, it's zero because it's got the sign of phi for the voltage expression, right? So because of the sine phi here component, both of those are at an angle of zero. So the voltage at infinity along the x-axis and at a row of one along the x-axis, they're both equal to zero. So the voltage, the voltage is actually, the voltage difference is zero. So the energy required is zero. If you did it in terms of um, the integral approach, the line integral approach, now you're only changing rho. So the DL component would only have a, a D rho so then this term would go away, but <clears throat> what you're left with the E field is just the sine of the, that angle, which again is zero. So it's the integral of zero, which again is, is zero. So, so either approach here for C, again, you get, there's no difference in potential energy. So there's no effort required to actually move the electron as the field is zero along, along that axis. Any questions? Okay, so In the third one, I'm going to have to use Gauss's law here. So it's an infinitely long cylinder of charge. So this is um, this is a solid cylinder. It's not a, a shell. So watch watch out for the terminology. A, a cylinder is a solid object instead of a cylindrical shell or a spherical shell. But here the, uh, the volume charge density is not constant. It's 
varies with, as a function of rho. Our shell, ha our, our cylinder has a radius of A, and then the charge density is zero here at, um, actually, I forgot to change this figure. Uh, in, in, our, in our textbook, this actually uses rho. I went through the test and tried to change the coordinates to match what we're currently using this semester as much as possible, but apparently I missed I missed the row, the R's that were in that figure. They should be converted to, to rows. I caught it in the equation. But um, first question is how much charge is contained within the, a section of the cylinder that is that is L meters long. So this is a volume that charge density. So it's coulombs per meter squared. That would be the units here. So this is a triple interval from zero to L along the, the, the Z axis. Um, and then the, the elemental volume element and cylindrical components, there's actually a, a rho D phi. And then there's a D rho. So long phi at zero to two pi and along row, it's zero to A. So plugging in our expression for uh, the charge density here, which is K zero rho. I'll write this one more time. We'll pull, up, we'll pull out the K zero, zero to A, zero to two pi, zero to L. And we have a row squared E Z, E phi, E rho. So the integral over Z, the integrand doesn't depend on Z. So that's just going to be L. Similarly for phi, we're gonna get two pi L. Okay. Now for rho, we're gonna integrate rho squared, we're gonna get rho cubed over three, evaluating at zero and A. So we'll get a cubed over three for the for the total charge density. So any questions about that? Okay, B for the electric flux density, you know, finding that directly, you know, our, what we have, you know, our, our easiest tool based on the symmetry in the problem is to actually set up, use Gauss's law, you know, on a cylindrical shell at a radius rho, and then we'll make it of length L because we've already found the charge in the length L. But Gauss's law in integral form Let's call it Q because that's what I called it there. So I'm, I'm going to make this surface. Now it's it's <clears throat> of radius rho instead of radius a, because it says here actually find it for rho greater than a. But the amount of charge enclosed is not a function of my shell. Okay. All of the charge is enclosed in this cylinder, which is of radius. A, and I'm finding the field outside that. You could just as easily find the field inside because of the symmetry there, but then the charge enclosed would also be a function of rho. So this is actually a little, a little bit easier. Now, 
And based on the symmetry, I'm going to say that rho could only have that, that, that our, our D field, our electric flux density field, could only have a rho dependence. Again, this thing is infinitely long. So it doesn't matter what Z height I'm at, I'm going to see the same picture. It doesn't matter. There's no dependence here on the angle and the charge density. So there's symmetry with respect to phi as well. Now, if, if that had a phi component, that wouldn't be true. And the, the D field would also have a phi component, but it can't. But as I get farther away, you know, this cylinder gets narrower and narrower. So I will allow it or will assume that it has some row dependence. It may turn out and it may turn out in the math that it, that it doesn't, but um, you know, that's, I know it doesn't have any dependence on, on the other variables. And then the, the surface element here, um, actually, I've got the tops and bottoms here, but on the top and bottom of the cylinder, the surface, remember that our um, elemental surface vector, the direction of it is normal to the surface. So on the top, it would be Z directed, on the bottom would be minus Z directed. But I've got to take this dot product, so those surfaces aren't going to contribute at all to this integral. Okay. So this integral, this is the closed surface. So I'm going to integrate around the outside of the shell, but it also includes the top and bottom. But because ds is normal to d, the top and bottom integrals are zero. So what I get here is I'll get d rho <coughs> And then my, my DS actually uh, is, is the area of this surface, um, the, the ring, and you can look that up, but it would be uh, rho D phi D Z. And then it's in the rho direction. I just lost this thing. It's a little crazy. I don't want the. So, um, I can pull out my row. So I'll have in this interval, I'll have row D row. And then here I'm what's left is the integral of the surface over B and Z. That's actually just the surface area of that ring, but that's that's going to be two pi um, uh, L. Two pi row L is actually the surface area of that ring. That's equal to the charge enclosed, which is K0 2 pi L A cubed over three. So my two pi L term cancels. And I get the row component is A cubed over three rho. So the D field would be A cubed over three rho. And then it's rho directed. Certainly not easy. It's probably the hardest problem on this exam, this E part. E part is, I'm sorry, a, a C part. All I'm looking for there is the relationship between E and D. So give me something. Even if you don't get B down, really for C, the answer, it's, it's D over epsilon. Is this in free space? Yeah, surrounded by air. 
So this would give you almost or probably full credit. Show a formula, never leave a problem blank, blank on an exam. I still see students do that, at least put down the formula that you would use. Uh, this thing's frozen. I'm freezing. Okay. So find the potential difference between a point at row equal A and a point at. Uh, so this is um, at some point B relative to the surface of my uh, um, cylinder of charge. So if you look on your formula sheet, and this is really the only formula we've got relating voltage and potential. So again, at least throw that down on the, on the formula sheet. So here, you know, E is only road directed. So when you when you write out DL, the only component you're going to have is this this D rho component. So in cylindrical coordinates, and DL is um, rho D rho plus rho D phi phi component plus D z. So when you do this dot product of E and DL, you're just going to get the row component. So it'd be A cubed three epsilon row B row from A to B or B to A between a point at A and a point at B. So this is minus A cubed over three epsilon. The integral of one over rho is natural log of rho. So A to B. So this becomes, uh, I dropped my K zero here. There it should have been here and here and here. I just failed to write it down. So it would also be here and here. I get minus KO A cubed three epsilon zero. It'd be natural log of rho, natural log of B minus natural log of A. The difference in natural logs is just the natural log of the ratio. So I can write that as natural log of B over A. <laughs> this is going to be a positive value because B is greater than A. The voltage is negative because I'm going in the direction of the field. And voltage decreases when you go in the direction of the field. My E field is pointing out. And then the, the last problem here is if an infinitely long hollow dielectric cylinder with inner radius rho equal b, where b is greater than a, is placed around, what is the electric flux density within the, the dielectric material? Um, if the, the relative permittivity of the material is ER is equal to 10. That, that's really just a trick question because the D field doesn't change. Okay, the E field changes, depends on the permittivity. But you know, if you go back to 
in Gauss's law here, um, that actually the result wouldn't change at all. Um, and so the answer to, to E is also K, K zero A cubed over three rho, rho hat. No change in the D field. Okay. So the four is uh, two concentric hollow conducting spheres. I probably use the terminology that they're perfect electrical conductors because that's what our textbook author is calling them. Um, I give you the voltage. It's, it's 10 A over B minus A, B minus R over R. This is the voltage between the two spheres. Um, and And it, you can see, it, I think, should meet the boundary conditions. When R is equal to A, this will be B minus A over A, and this reduces to just 10, which is the voltage here. When R is equal to B, of course, that will be zero, and the voltage would be zero. So it looks like it, it satisfies the boundary conditions. It, it is the correct expression. But you know, finding the electric field intensity between the two spheres. That's relatively simple. It's just a derivative operation. Finding the voltage from the electric field is you know, more difficult. You have to do this contour integration. We do have another method for finding the potential that's, that's using Poisson's equation or Laplace's equation, that differential equation. But here, in this case, where there's just the R dependence, it's just the partial of B with respect to R. And so if you carry through that, it's 10 AB over B minus A times one over R squared is the electric field. B asks for the charge enclosed. <coughs> Go back to Gauss's law. The, the the D field is just epsilon zero times E. So B is gonna be R hat 10 epsilon zero, A, B, B minus A, one over R squared. So again, this, this can be over any surface surrounding um, surrounding that, that inner sphere in between the two spheres. The, the simplest surface would be to choose another sphere. And so in this case, this becomes zero to two pi, zero to pi, 10 a b b minus a and then the <laughs> the volume integral was well, it's, it's we've got one over r squared but the the surface area is r squared sine theta 
d phi d theta. Again, look this up on that's on your formula sheet for a surface element. Okay, which the r squares here cancel out. And so when you the only thing you have to integrate is the sine theta from zero to pi. And that's actually uh, two. So you end up with 40 pi a b over b minus a as the charge enclosed. And then C is what's the capacitance? That's our charge divided by our voltage. So the voltage was, was given. So it's just this expression divided by, uh, uh, actually, no, this is the voltage at, at an arbitrary point between the two spheres. The voltage between the two spheres is 10 volts. That's actually just given, that's a constant. So it's just this divided by 10. So that's four pi AB over B minus A would be the capacitance between the two spheres. So any, any questions? If you find yourself with you know, half a page of algebra formulas, you've probably taken the wrong approach. Okay. The, the questions here are all relatively just a couple of lines of calculus. If you get hung up on an integral, you can just leave it in integral form. Okay, that'd be okay. Or ask me. I'll what, what an integral of one over r is, you know, natural log of r or something like that, or integral of sine theta d theta. I'll probably just write some simple integrals up, up on the board for, for your reference or provide another handout of some simple integrals that you may run into. But I expect you to kind of know the integral of r squared or the derivative of r cubed, things like that, or the derivative of sine and cosine. So you have those memorized. But. Any questions? All right, I'll be around uh, you know, all day tomorrow. Pretty busy on the on rest of the day today with classes. It, it is open text, so bring your textbook, but I'll also have, you can also have the, the two formula sheets. You can look over those, make sure you understand those. Uh, some other topics we, we covered, which were not on this exam, is you know, coordinate system conversions. You know, I couldn't ask you to do that um, and then also Laplace's equation um, that wasn't on anywhere on the exam either. Okay, that's it.